Welcome to my talk about XRF at the bum line. It's a little bit chaotic. I have to apologize because I it's the first time I made it via Zoom and I prepared everything and then at nine o'clock in the morning I see that in my house at home the internet is down. I think everybody's using internet at the moment, so I had to rush to bum to set up everything. I just arrived two minutes ago. So I hope everything will work. And the other thing is that I yesterday at night I decided to change my talk completely. So it was all about the passing example. It was about finding illnesses. It was about um, corrosion. It was about air pollution. And I think in these days now, probably it's better to have a little nicer talk, um, to have some more nice examples. So I decided to take examples from art and culture. Anyhow, the basic um, the basic talk is the same. It will be a short application. What is the synchrotron? Not going into the details. What is X-ray fluorescence? And then I come to the examples. And at the end, I will introduce something to you, which is called a color X-ray camera, which is a brand new detector. Oh, it's, uh, it's not anymore brand new, but it's a relatively new detector, which can make some nice things. So let's start with the synchrotron. <coughs> Sorry. So from the practical point of view, the synchrotron is just a light source. And it's a light at the big trace normally. And you have a broad energy spectrum from it. So you have a variable energy. You can choose what energy you want to use. It's just a very high brightness, meaning you have a lot of photons. Um, so that you can focus it on a small, you can measure on a small spot, or you can measure very fast. And the X-rays which are coming from there are polarized, which means they're only, um, uh, that you have a minimum of scattering in one direction. So you have a lot of scattering, and uh, compton scattering, it's depending on the angle from the incoming beam. So you can put your detector on a, place where you don't have scattering, which is nice for X-ray fluorescence. And with a broader picture, the synchrotron is a multi-user facility, which means it's a very big facility. But for example, at Bessie, where I'm working, where the bum line is, um, where we have our beam line, there are about 50 beam lines, 50 persons working at the same time. So it looks very big and very expensive. But if you break it down to the cost Per hours per experiment, it's not much more expensive than a normal laboratory. And for you, if you want to use it, it's another advantage, it's even free, because it works like this way that you make a proposal, and then you get beam time or not. And if you get beam time, you have to publish your data, and then you get your beam time for free. Just some technical data for Bessie. Or I say that's our beam line, the bum line. So it has a circumference of 240 micrometer. The electron's energy is 1.7 GeV. That means the electrons, which are cycling there, are nearly with the speed of light. Um, we have a beam current of 300 milliamperes, and it's always filled up. So it's top up mode, so we have very stable conditions. So coming back to what is synchrotron radiation to get it a little more clearer. So we get synchrotron radiation whenever the electron is forced to derivate from a straight line motion. So when it's accelerated. And as you have seen, the synchrotron is a circle. And so it's accelerated every time it's making a curve. And so typical um, spectra you get are from a few electron volts up to 100 TV more or less. And the range where X-ray fluorescence takes mainly part, it's between five and 40 TV. Then you get nearly all elements via K lines or via L lines. And yeah, and generally you have your synchrotron radiation, your synchrotron coming, which makes your synchrotron radiation. 
this radiation as a real sample. And what can ha happen with scattering or deflection? I think that's what you have heard the last few days of. It can be absorbed. So you can do something called xanes or exafs, which you can look at the nearest neighbor and the atoms and the oxidation states, or of course, computer tomography. And it all can make fluorescence. And fluorescence means that your photon hits your sample or an atom in your sample, and then it kicks out one of the inner shells, for example, uh, one of the inner shell electrons, for example, from the case shell. And that's not a good state for an atom, so it will be filled up. Um, so the kick out happens here. So it will be filled up from an outer shell, for example, from the case L shell. Then you have a transition where some energy gets free, and this energy is emitted as a so-called characteristic radiation. And this radiation from the energy, you can see what element is there. For example, if you get 8 keV, you know that's copper. If it's 6.4 keV, it's iron, and so on. And you can make quantitative analysis from calculations on how much of this characteristic, characteristic radiation you get. So here's a layout of the BAM line, which is quite typical for many beam lines in the world. So we have our source, which is in our case, this a wavelength shifter, mm -hmm. which is just a magnet where the electron, which is circling, makes a dump, makes a, a very fast curve, fast motion. And therefore we have high energies. So you can find all those formulas very easy on the net. Um, there are a lot of tutorials, so I won't go into the details now. The only thing, um, you can see my cursor? Okay, um, so this is the normal spectra. If you have here the photon energy and here the flux. So the normal bending magnets, which actually made the curve, the curving of the electron beams, have emits photons up to more or less 20 keV. And this wavelength shifter, which is a special device, a certain device, we can see we get photons up to 100 keV. Um, then we have a slit system. We have some filters to form the beam. The filters are mainly to take out the low energy part. It only makes noise afterwards in your experiment. We have double multilayer monochromator. These are multilayers are um, artificial crystals with just one dimension state, so it with a Bragg law. And but because you have limited numbers of layers and they are not so perfect you don't have a very good energy resolution, which is actually what you want if you use multilayers, because then you get a higher flux. If we really need the good energy resolution, we have a double crystal monochromator, silicon 111 or silicon 311, where we can choose exactly the energy, typically with an energy resolution of one keV, uh, of one electron volt, one electron volt. We have another slit where we can decide which beam size we want to have at the end. So with slits, we can work down to 50 microns, 100 microns. Um, if we put special devices like compound reflective lenses, we can go down to one micron. <clears throat> and at the end, the beam is going to the experiment. So this is a real picture. This is a crystal monochromator. This is a multilayer monochromator. This is an all in one hutch, which is called the optical hutch. And then the beam comes to the experimental hutch. So this is the typical setup we have. So we have the beam coming out here. We have first the ionization chamber where we can monitor the incoming flux. So the last slit system to make the sample size. We have a remote control table where we can put the sample exactly where we want to have it, a microscope to control this. And here we have a very simple detector, detector. And of course, all this is in a hutch 
with shielded with lead because we have um, radiation up to 100 keV. So, yeah, it must be shielded. We're not allowed to be there during the experiment. So now we came to the nice part, I think, which it's nicer than coronavirus or the other epidemics I plan to talk about today. Um, so one of the main parts, except this technical material to analyze at the bum line, it's gold, and it's gold from the Bronze Age, Medieval Age, from the Vikings, so we have a lot of examples in this area. And if an archaeologist or art historian comes to us, it brings us something, and the first question is always, is it real gold? So this was the case, for example, with this sample, it's from a private collection, and Actually, the bum earned money was this analysis, which is very rare at the bum line. And it was an old lady. She came to us with this part and said, I remember in my youth, all these parts here were really golden. And now this image, it's, it seems a little golden, but if you have it in the end, it's really brownish, dirty. And they said, yeah, it's in my living room, the living room of my family since 100 years, everybody is smoking, and it's getting dirty, more dirty, more dirty all the time. We said, okay, we will have a look. And we brought it to the bum line, fixed it there, and met it at different places, and actually really found gold, found big traces of gold, which means um, that's very interesting, except that uh, principle for Egyptian things because only pharaohs were of the family of the pharaoh was allowed to use gold. So this is a really important thing from the pharaonic times. But that was not too hard. And next thing we studied is a portrait of Nicolia Bergard. It's made for Jan van Eyck, a famous painter. And it's a silver point drawing. And silver point drawings are very rare because they're really hard to make. You cannot correct it nowadays. Like nowadays, if you use a pencil, you can use a rubber afterwards and correct what you have made wrong. That's not possible with silver pointer. And, and silver pointer were very expensive to this times. So you can think of, they will use one. And a special thing, but, um, we have analyzed a lot of the silver point drawings, a lot of Dürer, Rembrandt, and this van Eyck, but this van Eyck is very special because it's from the 15th century, the only one, and it has these inscriptions here. And unfortunately, you cannot read it with a rare eye, but um, it says something like, the eye is blue, the hair is brown, and there exists a real painting of this in in Vienna. So this is made like drawing by numbers. So they just copied these paintings, and then they filled in the colors which Jan von Eyck have um, indicated at this script. So we um, analyzed this painting at various points, which is actually hard to do because what seems like lines in the painting actually are scattered particles that just gives the impression of the line. And if we analyze it with our beam, we typically have uh, 50 nanograms, 50 nanograms of samples and a lot of underground, of background. So we need a very sensitive method and different method to test it. And actually only micropixel worked at Vienna and our setup is micro XRF. It's a circuit. So, to be non destructive and get all the elements quantitatively and sensitive enough. So, what we got were spectra at different points. And yeah, the so results were at the end. Actually, not one pointer was used, but three pointer. This is the first time ever 
found in a painting that three different pointer were used. And that one of this was actually not a silver pointer, but was a gold pointer. So for the art historians, this was really big stuff. The next question, which is normally coming is, how old is it? So here we must say, actually nothing, we don't know it. We can just determine element concentration, but we cannot say nothing about ages. Third question, which parts belong together? So this can have different applications. So if different parts of a treasure were found at different times, you're not quite sure if they're really from the same treasure. This is, for example, for the Hiddensee treasure, a famous wicking treasure. Or if you have a, an object which is mounted from different parts, you can say something, are they all mounted at the same time? Or do you have a history? For the most famous example, we had our bum line. I think it's the most famous object we ever had at the bum line. It's a so-called Skydis of Debra. It's a bronze age artifact, which was found around 2000 from um, grave uh, diggers, you know, rubber, from rubbers in, in Nebra, in a mountain near Nebra. And it's about the size of 32 centimeters, which is like a big pizza and weights two kilogram. There's 32 stars on it. That's a sun bark, which is this part here on the bottom. As a round object, would be the sun or the full moon, or maybe I change the meaning over time. There's this crescent moon, which actually has a problem that there's a star behind it, so it's a little inaccurate. And you have actually two horizon bars. One is still here, and one it have been on the other side. You can still see it how, how it have been, but it was lost. It was already lost in antiquity. So the position was about 1,600 before Christ, maybe 2,000. And the dating was done by the swords. So you can, this is the situation, how it was found. And swords, really, archaeologists archaeologist can look at it and can say very precise how old they are. And as well, some organic material was found with the swords, actually not with the disc. So the assumption of all is that they belong together. And it was thought that maybe it had been used about 400 years. The archaeologists say it, but actually I, I don't know how this number was made. I didn't understand that. <clears throat> and why it's so important? Because it's first ever a picture of the real picture of the sky. And it's older than Egyptian, it's older than uh, Mesopotamian, everything you can think of. But the main part of the step, seven stars, which are the Pleiades, and this, this can serve as a calendar. So the last visibility in the western evening sky is during spring, so you have to plant. And the last, and the first fall in the western morning sky is at autumn, so you have to harvest. So that was really important information for the different folks. Didn't have another calendar. And it's the first and only representation of the cosmos of prehistoric Europe. The sun bark has a connection with northern mythology because the idea behind the sun bark is that the sun goes to the sun bark in the night and make a circle around the earth during the night and come back in the morning. So that makes a relationship with the Eastern Mediterranean. And some of the archaeologists say it's like a manual for Stone Age or other archaeological sites. And we measured there, the typical spectra we get looks like this. So we get, of course, oh, we measured the gold parts, and I forgot to mention this. All about our part of the problem was analyzed by millions of different methods. 
our part of the project was to see what we can see about the gold parts. So we, of course, we got the gold signal written around here. Gold is very heavy element, so we got air lines. So there are more edge heads, we got a lot of lines here. We got some signals from copper. There were silver in it and tin. And here you can see one of the problems we have with X-ray fluorescence. So the tin, carbeta, alpha, which is a big peak uh, on tin. So alpha here it's carbeta. It's below the silver peak. And there's much more silver than tin. So the tin peak is not very good to see. So we analyzed the carbeta peak and we had enough counts in carbeta to really have, to have enough excitation intensity. So actually what we got are three groups. So we got all the stars um, together with this moon parts. This were one group, then this, this were this group. Then we have the bark, which is here, gives another group. Uh, sorry, the stars and the moon are this group here. And actually the most interesting group is this one, because this is a horizon ball here, and the star. And this star is actually this star here. So you can see it has been moved. So now from this different information and the images, the real images from the disk, we can reconstruct, uh, reconstruct um, five phases of the disk. So first were only all the stars and the maybe the sun and then this crescent moon. After this, this horizon poles were mounted. So these are only images from the night sky. So the horizon bow, actually, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but if you at the place where the disk have been found, and you look to the bottom, with the mountain at the Harz in Germany, not so far away, and you look over the middle of the disk, then this angle is where the um, so you make a line from the middle to one of these lines uh, to one of these edges, and then this this angle is the uh, setting of the moon at spring, at the beginning of spring and beginning of autumn. So if you put your disc right and you just look out the day, our sunset is here you know we're in the middle of the year, the middle between autumn and spring. And that was the second phase. Now you have a relation to the sun. And the third phase, this sun bark was mounted, which is clearly the sun. And fourth phase was making these holes. Nobody knows really why. It, um, the idea that have been fixed somewhere. And in the fifth phase in antiquity, already this horizon bow have been dismounted uh, before the, they put the disc away. So nobody really knows why as well. Maybe they have been angry because there was some bad weather and it didn't work anymore. Nobody knows. The overall interesting idea is that it was important information encoded in the disk and the person who knows this had power. So there was some person with power and he had even the power to change the meaning of the disk. So the archaeologists, archaeologists say so this has been a hierarchical uh, society. The other question is, of course, where does the gold come from? And we worked with a database called the Hartmann database. And there it's an analysis of 
hundreds of thousands of objects, and they're the best um, fingerprint, the best the, the, the best values here that um, analysis of the for the disk were in Romania. So we saw that this time the gold from the disk was from Romania, but that have been proven to be wrong, as they have been made more analyzes, and they said, okay, it's a very important information, we can take some samples. And they made laser ablation ICMS, which is much more sensitive, so they can get more elements, which were not possible with XLF, and they can get isotopic information. So they got this information, and then another important part was that they analyzed, I think, 200 known and deposits of anti-gold during the Bronze Age. They analyzed it again so they get a better database. And then they found out probably at Tom Cornwall. They found a, a, Rio, a, a river in Cornwall where the fingerprint fits very nice. And actually, with this additional information, the synchronic self data fits there as well. So we are not we were not wrong. We just haven't enough information at that time. We were involved in for so 2001, 2002, and 2011. More information to get. This was the example from our first part of this example of archaeology. Now I want to introduce to you a new device. Which was the Dielectric Camera. <coughs> Actually, it was already invented in 2000, but it was invented for um, space. So it's on the XMN Newton. And the last time you have heard some news of it, made some images. And it's uh, the task of the project we had here was to bring science from space to the laboratory. So it was a project together with, a, at this time it's called EFG, it's the Institute for Scientific Instruments, nowadays it's Fischer. It's PN sensors, which really made the chip, which is the heart of the experiment. EFG made the optics as well, very important. And part of the BAM was to make software and to make experiments at the synchrotron. And the chip looks like this. So in principle, it's a normal CCD ship, but it's thicker, so it's 450 micron. It's like a, nowadays X-ray detectors are. And it has a worse um, pixel resolution, so it's a pixel size that's 50 by 50 micro, or 48 by 48 microns, which gives 70,000 pixel at all. And it's divided in different areas. The whole um, chip, it's a little bigger because we only measure in the middle and then for the readout, the charges are transferred to the sides to get more time. So make it a desk time free, that time free device. We can read it out with 1000 Hertz, get a count rate of around 2 million count per second. And the that's 450 micrometer thick, which means we can really use it from 3 to 20 keV. It works with high energies and efficiency really good. And this is what we got from this device. So actually it looks like a normal XRF spectra. This is a spectra from a manganese foil. But actually this is not one spectra, this is 70,000 spectra overlaid. So they really managed to get each of these pixels gives you a full energy dispersive spectra, and they really all look the same, 70,000. So it's really high tech, really nice device. And you, below you can see here that you can see all the elements which are in a, in a standard. So this is one part. Second important part is the optics. Of course, if you just have a CCD chip without optics, you don't get an image. Easiest thing you can do is just to put a pinhole. That works like a normal camera obscura with optical light. A little more sophisticated, it's capillary optic. So there are two types of optics. 
One is just parallel cylinders where you get a one-to-one -one image. And one you have the cylinders which are formed in a way that your input diameter is smaller than your output diameter. You get a magnification. We get a magnification of the optic. We have, have a magnification of a factor of six. Actually, the best one they have made up to now, I think it's a factor of nearly 10. One of the nice applications I stay at art is Phoenician ivory. So Phoenician were people living in, here near the Mediterranean, and they're famous because they invented the alphabet. And in their times, 2,100 BC, um, they really were at the whole Mediterranean one of the leading people there. Ivory, which we looked at, it's uh, from tusk and teeth of animals. It's um, calcium phosphate mainly, and it's since Stone Age, or since 32,000 before our time, it's already have been used to make sculptures. They're really old examples. And they're all white, normally. But on the Phoenician, it's known that they're painted as things. So we put some parts of the synchrotron. Actually, these measurements have been made at Karlsruhe because it was easier to bring the camera to Karlsruhe than to bring the pieces to Berlin. Um, that's all the time a problem with cultural heritage objects to bring them to the synchrotron. But here, you can see the three objects which have been analyzed. You can see they're basically white. But if we have a look at them with the color camera, we can see we found calcium, iron, copper, lead, titanium, magnesium, manganese. We can see, okay, probably there have been some paint. And from this we can reconstruct how it probably have looked. But we have only looked for the elements, not for the molecules which are there. There are different possibilities. It's not 100% clear, uh, but this is one possibility. And funny, we have also found gold. So I can keep with my gold examples. And there have been a reconstruction that it, maybe it have been looked like this in the original uh, time. But with this camera, we can do more. So if we have a 1D detector and a small beam, we can go step by step and make a 2D image of this easily. And of course, if we already have a 2D image from our detector, we want to go 3D. And one possibility is to make something we call slicing. This is we make a broad and flat beam and we move our sample through the beam and measure each slice the composition. And then we can put all the slices together and have a 3D um, object without the task of um, calculations like in computer tomography. We don't need to reconstruct data. Let's then put them together. And one of the examples is these. So this is, is a one-to-one -one image which you can see the calcium and the iron, it's teeth from a mouse, a red tooth thorax, and it's called red tooth thorax because it had red tooth, and the red is coming from iron. And so we can here see the normal 2D distribution. And you can see the iron and the of the calcium, but nicer is if we do the slicing, and if we concentrate not on all the tooth, but on just one, one of them. We can make slice for slice and see where is the calcium, where is the iron, and at the end we can combine them to get a 3D image. So this is a very nice thing. I think I really liked it. And our news results just from last year, which are my favorite at the moment, it's if you look at the optics. Even if you use this polycapillary, polycapillary, polycapillary optic, each pixel 
of the retina just looks through one hole. No? So you get a very small efficiency of your system. It's basically the same if you have this polycapillary optics from the efficiency as if you put a pinhole here. Because every detector is looking through one hole, through the pinhole, it's all the same hole, with a capillary optic, Everybody, every detector looks through a different hole, but still it's one hole. So the only way to make it more, efficiency, more efficient is to use something we call coded apertures, so it's like a pinhole optic, but not with one pinhole, but with a whole bunch of them. And then every point on the optic looks to different pinholes, and you get more intensity. So in our case, we have 12 pinholes. So we get 12 times intensity in theory. And it's little, but basically it's 12 times intensity. But it comes with a price. So, if this is just, this is not measured images, this is just images. This is how our coded apertures looks like. And what we then measure on our camera looks like this. This is calculated. If we have this image, put it through this coded apertures, what we measure gives this. So now, of course, um, we are not very happy because the resolution is lost. So we have to recalculate it. We do it with machine learning. So what we have done is we took around 20,000 of these images, make the calculation, how would it look like if it, if it goes to the good apertures with these images. And then we trained a network to make the calculation backwards which works actually quite nice. So this is an image we measured from an ammonite. Ammonite is a petrified animal. And this is just from one element, um, the heat scale. But um, yeah, this is another element. So there was one important question we have to ask. So what are adequate machine learning data? Big data lives from a lot of data. And, and it's always as well dependent the, your result from the quality of your input data. And so we looked or thought about what input data would be nice. We just took some scattered points because we said, okay, all the images looks like scattered points. Again, we have areas, so we added some squares. At the end said, okay, this reminds me of what? So I got a provide of pictures of galaxies from NASA. So what I have done is I've downloaded 1,000 images from NASA of different galaxies, makes this reconstruction, construction, reconstruction, so, and this is the reconstruction we got with these images. So this looks quite nice, I think. And of course, the color camera measures all these elements at the same time. So we can take different elements. So these are three different elements. We can reconstruct these images. This is my favorite result from the last year. So we're able to reconstruct really nicely the images of the coded apertures, so we can combine the higher efficiency with a good special resolution. This is just to complete the selection of the input images. The first one image we get, if we use just the point images as input source, so we got points in our output image. This is, oops, this is if we add the squares, so it look like squares. I'm sure if we add, make it always Lego blocks or something like this, it will look like this. And with the nice images from the galaxies, we really get a nice image, which looks convincing. So this is coming to the end of my talk.
I hope I have shown you we have multi-element method. We can measure multi-elements at the same time. We got qualitative and quantitative information. We are non-destructive, which is important sometimes. We have a good special resolution. I have, haven't shown you today, but it's one micrometer at the bum line. It's very flexible. We can make total reflection to get better detection limits, grazing incident, grazing accident, Xanes, exhausts, a lot of variations. And it's important if you're going to do it some day in your career for free, if you just buy the proposal. And with this uh, 3D image of our net, I want to say thank you to all of you to have listened all the time. So, if there's any questions, I'm happy. Um, Martin, uh for that color x-ray camera, um, since the entire readout is happening on the edge of the chip, uh, what, is the, um, what is the average count rate that the, that the chip can handle um, during an experiment? It's two million counts per second. Okay, over, over, the, entire, <coughs> over the entire chip surface. Yeah. But then you get... It's not very much if you mm -hmm. bring it down per pixel. It's mm -hmm. um, 10 counts per pixel, 15 counts per pixel or something like that. Yeah, but then for every pixel, you, you end up with, uh, with energy sensitivity. So if you count long enough, you have, um, uh, you have a, good, uh, uh, a good spectrum for every pixel. So how, how long are those measurements uh, taking then uh, on, a, on, on, on Bessie? And I suppose when you take the camera uh, to one of these uh, heritage sites, uh, you use a portable source, so the times are probably different. Actually, we only have measured at the synchrotron up to now. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the times are not, as you need more time at the lab, of course. Mm -hmm. But with a modern source, it's not so much difference. Because, to be honest, Bessie it's 20 years old. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different situation if you go to ESRF or to Hamburg. But the flux is not so much, it's an order of magnitude, maybe higher than a really good modern laboratory source. And if you have enough, if you don't go for traces, but just want to see an image, like for the ammonite example, you can see the image after 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. If you don't, just to see the image. If you need a good statistic, you have to measure more to more. But if you're after images, it's a question of minutes. Mm -hmm. So the good thing, sometimes the bad thing, that's a bum line is that we don't have a fixed setup. So we're really flexible. We can make all kinds of measurements for all kinds of materials. We had a lot of space, physical, so we can put in really big samples. We can put in sample environments. Um, and normally we do XRF, Xanes, XRF, computer tomography. But we have as well the so called MuSpot, which is um, nearly identical beamline, some restrictions, um, where we do small angel X-ray scattering, other scatterings. So you can do all kinds of stuff at the moment. Yep. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm.